North Korea's fourth nuclear test and the victory of the independence-leaning Democratic Progressive Party in Taiwan prove that the U.S.-China relationship is a delicate and deliberate balancing act. This balancing act seems manageable for the time being, but domestic political developments in both countries threaten to exacerbate tensions between Washington and Beijing. Although our two current leaders continue to emphasize positive developments, Chinese and American views of the other are not very positive. According to a May 2016 Pew survey, just 38% of Americans had a favorable view of China, compared to a global median of 55%. And only 44% of Chinese had a positive view of the US, in contrast to a global median of 69%. A recent Carnegie report found that more than three quarters of Chinese believe that Americans are greedy, aggressive, arrogant, or violent. And now, with the president-elect Trump, these views most certainly have changed, and probably for the worse on the Chinese side following his recent phone call with Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen and his subsequent tweets over the One China policy. Nevertheless, the U.S.-China relationship today is more than a series of encounters and incidents. It is a slow and historic process in which two great powers are learning to engage effectively while managing their many differences, differences that may seem wholly irreconcilable. In order to understand that relationship, you must go beyond the day-to-day -day headlines and look for themes and trends. You must take the long view, something Americans are not particularly good at. And this is why the Kissinger Institute launched this annual event four years ago. Because as daily China watches, we realized how easy it was to get caught up in the dense details of the relationship. And it is even harder for those who do not wake up every morning thinking about what President Xi had for breakfast, but are just as curious about China to go beyond the headlines. And so this annual program was meant not only to package a year's worth of events in a compact 90-minute discussion, but, mostly, but most importantly to tease out the broader themes and trend lines of the relationship and to do a bit of policy prophesizing for 2017 as well. And that is why um, I am very delighted to have with us today three of Washington's best China oracles. First, we have Richard McGregor, who was a public policy fellow at the Wilson Center in 2015. He served as the Washington bureau chief for the Financial Times from 2011 to 2014. Richard is also the author of The Party, The Secret World of China's Communist Rulers, and his forthcoming book on U.S.-China-Japan relations is scheduled to be released September 2017, which he did a lot of work here at the Wilson Center for. I've asked Richard to touch on major security flashpoints in the region, such as the East and South China Sea disputes, Taiwan, and the Koreas, among other issues. Second, we have Dr. Joanna Lewis, who is currently an Associate Professor of Science, Technology, and International Affairs at Georgetown University. Her research focuses on energy, environment, and innovation in China, including renewable energy, industry development, and climate change policy. In addition to her many other accolades listed in her bio, which you should have, Dr. Lewis is a proud alumnus of the Wilson Center Fellowship Program as well. I have asked Dr. Lewis to focus on climate change and energy cooperation, some of the more positive aspects. Last but not least, we have Robert Daly. Robert is the second director of the Kissinger Institute, Prior to coming to the Wilson Center, he was director of the China program at the University of Maryland. And prior to that, he spent six years in Nanjing as the American director of the Johns Hopkins University Nanjing Center. Robert's remarks will focus on ideological competition as well as soft power in science and tech and cultural and education relations. Thank you all again for being here. I should note to our audience that we are live webcasting this event and the recording will be made available to view as shortly after. And with that, I will hand it over to Richard. I guess he, like all of us, will be close to the mic because of the webcast. Is that right? You want us right up? Right. Okay. Close to the mic. Is that close enough? Yes. <laughs> uh, thanks very much. I'm going to really stick, uh, as Sandy said, with uh, China's relations with uh, the region, in other words, basically other Asian countries. Um, uh, Robert is going to do U.S.-China, so he gets to make all the Trump jokes, um, <laughs> unless you're, it's time to be more respectful now. I'm not laughing. Um, the... Um, so let me give let let me let me structure this in a way where you do when you're sort of weighing up a job offer or something like that you know the pluses and the minuses where China has done well and where it's done I think badly uh, this year in in a very broad sense. So let's start on the uh, let's start on the negative side. Um, uh, uh, 
Japan, um, which is obviously uh, China's biggest regional rival uh, and the most powerful country in the region uh, uh, besides China. Uh, relations went into a deep freeze in 2012 in, uh, when the, the Jap China Japanese nationalized the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands. Um, and I think we could say now the relations have come out of the deep freeze, but they're barely thawing. I think she has met uh, President Xi has met Prime Minister Abe two or three times since then, but basically really because he couldn't avoid meeting him. Um, you know, hosting APEC, hosting the G20 in Hangzhou. I think as a good host, um, President Xi had no choice but to meet Abe. Uh, and he didn't do it in a way which, um, which um, uplifted the relationship at all. Uh, you know, he, he met him in, a, in G20, he met him in a, a smaller room than he met other countries. He met him, he made sure when he met him, the, the Japanese flag was not hanging uh, um, uh, behind them for the photo op. Uh, and the Japanese press, when they reported the meeting, um, put it at the put the uh, put Abe at the bottom of the page compared to all the other regional leaders uh, who were consecrated uh, at that time. Um, you know, it was very unfortunate, I think, for Japan and for China that the uh, Senkaku Diaoyu uh, Islands um, dispute flared up so dramatically in 2012, just at the time that President Xi was taking over as party secretary. So I don't think he had any choice at that time but to take a really, really tough line, and it's very difficult uh, for them to climb down. At the same time, the Japanese are taking a much tougher line with China. They're in no hurry um, to, from their perspective, to uh, prostrate themselves to get relations back on track. I think if things do go well, then it's possible Mr. Abe would go to um, uh, China next year, and then President Xi would come to Japan in 2018. The symmetry of that, of course, is that uh, Jiang Zemin went to Japan in uh, 1998, Hu Jintao in 2008, and so this would be another visit a decade later. That, of course, tells you how bad relations are, that they can only do it once a decade. At the same time, from the Chinese perspective, the U.S.-Japan relationship has got tighter, um, I think it's no secret that uh, Obama and uh, President Obama and Mr. Abe did not have a very warm and friendly personal relationship, but I think over time they managed to have a much more productive professional relationship, and so the defense ties have tightened significantly. Um, uh, I was in Japan last week standing on the deck of a mini new Japanese mini carrier with the U.S. Defense Secretary. Um, um, you know, the Japanese are spending more on their military uh, right now. They're, they're having passed a law to give, you know, remove some of the sort of shackles of the post-war constitution. They are now, can now much do much more with the U.S. and their forces are becoming much more in interoperable. Uh, also, at the same time, Abe, uh, I think, is quite well known, his views on the war. Uh, he has been a revisionist. Even worse than being a revisionist, uh, he's actually enunciated those views in public. Uh, that has been to the extreme annoyance, I think, of Washington, who think Abe's uh, views on the war are damaging strategically. Uh, they hurt relations with South Korea. Uh, they upset relations with China. But I think over the past two years or so, Mr. Abe has become much smarter about how he manages history issues. Um, he made a speech here. Um, he made the uh, 70th anniversary statement expressing remorse for the war and is now going to Pearl Harbor in, um, in a matter of weeks, I think, uh, as well. So from a U.S. perspective, uh, in a very cold way, Abe is managing history much better. So let's go through some of the other countries um, uh, very quickly. Uh, China has been having a terrible, or giving Singapore a terrible time recently, and that was over uh, a communique at an international meeting on the South China Sea. You know, Singapore has been getting the full Global Times treatment um, of a thorough thrashing in the paper day after day for its attitude. And of course, we saw um, Singapore Taiwan military ties coming back into focus with this seizure of the armed carriers in Hong Kong. Um, you know, China's known about these, uh, you know, has always sort of tolerated uh, this remarkable relationship Singa has, Singapore has with Taiwan, but they're really showing now that they're not going to put it up, put up with it uh, at no cost for much longer. Uh, the same goes for South Korea over its decision to uh, deploy THAAD. 
Now, of course, that may change uh, once uh, President Park goes. Um, uh, I, I don't know enough about internal South Korean politics to make a prediction about that, but that has really hurt Beijing's relations with Seoul. And of course, we've got another illustration of that by the sort of payback, which is now being meted out to uh, um, uh, South Korean companies like Lotte uh, in China. Uh, actually, Lotte is a great target for the Chinese because it's a South Korean Japanese company, so even better. Um, look at uh, Beijing's relations with Hong Kong and uh, Taiwan. Uh, where in Hong Kong you have this remarkable, I don't know whether you call it a localist movement or an independent movement, there seem, independence movement, there seems to be two strands to it, but that has really soured relations with Hong Kong. Uh, naturally, the election of a DPP government in Taiwan, uh, even though Madame Tsai is no Chen Shui Bian, I, I must say, that has also not been good for cross-straits ties as well. Uh, we've seen a flow-on effect there on the numbers of tourists being allowed to go to Taiwan have dropped uh, pretty dramatically. From the mainland? mainland. From the, I'm sorry, from China. Um, you know, China, when you think about it, you know, China, you, there's about 47 cities these days, I think, in China now, which have direct flights to Taiwan. Quite amazing, actually. And that was built up during, I think, or rapidly accelerated during Ma ying time. But the Chinese can still, you know, turn off the tap uh, if they want to. South China Sea generally um, has been um, uh, a negative for regional relations. Uh, the Philippines' decision in The Hague, um, it seems like decades ago since what's happened since, but that was a really sour point uh, earlier this year. Uh, Malaysia, Australia, New Zealand um, have all been criticized for um, their stance or statements on the South China Sea. Uh, and Indonesia, of course, uh, teaming up with India uh, at the moment on the South China Sea. And also, of course, Indonesia has been taking a very high profile, uh, has, has had, had a very high profile response to the incursion of fishing boats, foreign fishing boats into its territorial waters, uh, blowing them up theatrically on television, um, which, of course, um, nobody likes, least of all, uh, Beijing. So. I always start from the pretext that China as a, uh, a giant country naturally wants to dominate the Asia-Pacific. Um, uh, it, um, it doesn't want the U.S. to leave quickly, but I think it would like to push it out in a sort of gradual, stable, you know, flash fashion, sort of, you know, bourgeois decline, if you like, uh, for the U.S. in the region. Um, but on that negative side of the report card, I think if China does dominate uh, the region anytime soon, it's going to be a very sort of sour, curdled bunch of relationships they're going to have. Because in all those relationships, I think China's problem is it's lost the ability to seduce. It's lost the ability to persuade countries. It's lost the ability to reassure countries uh, about its intentions um, in the region. And that's very negative. And I think in that respect, on this side of the ledger, We've got a sort of global timesization of foreign policy in which countries which step out of line get beaten up on, and I think that has a really negative effect on uh, public opinion in foreign countries uh, towards China. Um, let's go back now to the other side of the ledger in a binary fashion, if you like, and where China has done much better this year. Um, most important thing, of course, is uh, you know the Chinese economy has kept growing. Um, uh, the wobbles we saw earlier this year and late late last year and earlier this year, particularly with financial markets, um, uh, have come off. Now, of course, um, the fact that they get land absolutely on 6.5 percent growth may just tell you that they continue to store up problems for further down the track. Um, that this is a you know a debt fueled um, growth which <clears throat> sooner or later they're going to have to pay the price for. But in the meantime, uh, it's you know a, it's stabilised. Uh, um, they've managed the property market and the like. Um, and as long as the Chinese economy keeps keeps growing, I think that's the fundamentals of its power, global power and regional power. Um, so that's a plus. Um, let's have a look at the Philippines. Of course, we had a dramatic change in the Philippines with the election of President Duterte. 
viscerally anti-American individual. Uh, he immediately reached out to China, and China has been very uh, receptive um, um, to his outreach. Uh, they've done a kind of temporary deal allowing fishing boats, Filipino fishing boats back into the Scarborough Shoals, which is the area in dispute in 2012, um, which really sent relations uh, um, plummeting uh, with Manila. Um, another point, I think, about the uh, President Duterte, um, I talked a second ago about the global timesization of Chinese foreign policy. One of the good things for Beijing, I think, about the uh, President Duterte is, is it's, it's allowed the foreign ministry um, or the diplomats in China, if you like, to take charge of the relationship. In other words, to give um, uh, the Philippines some breathing space, space to handle it in a professional manner without the sort of you know abuse and threats and to offer inducements to the Philippines so perhaps we can get back to the point from China's point of view where they are able to seduce and persuade um, uh, the Philippines um, that their uh, intentions are good, uh, if you like. Anyway, that's been a big plus for China, a big negative for the US uh, in Asia. Uh, Thailand, of course, remains in the deep freeze with the U.S. because of the, uh, the um, um, lingering outcome of the uh, military coup a couple of years ago. Uh, Cambodia and Laos, I think, in ASEAN are firmly in the Chinese camp. Um, the um, uh, South Korea, um, I think I mentioned earlier, if ma once Madam Park goes... Um, and the opposi if the opposi opposition leader gets elected, he's likely to be more pro-China. I don't know whether he'll get rid of Thad. Um, but, you know, the uh, Madam Park two, three years ago was spoken about with great bitterness by the Japanese um, because, you know, she refused to meet Abe because of history issues. She went to Beijing for the 70th anniversary of the war uh, ceremony. Uh, if you go to Tokyo now, they speak of Madame Park as much more of a stateswoman and the like, but unfortunately it, this is the point at, in which she's in terminal decline. So sort of losses in South Korea, Beijing may have a chance to make them up. Um, I think we should also look at China's economic diplomacy, which has been very uh, successful. Uh, the Asia Investment uh, Infrastructure Bank is up and running and I think starting its first loans. Uh, the One Belt, One Road initiative uh, is also up and running uh, and funds are flowing there. We can also see the fruits of Chinese economic diplomacy, um, which really, you know, started 10, 15 years ago. Um, I think the pipeline, correct me if I'm wrong, um, um, from a port in Burma, uh, traveling uh, overland now to China is running. Uh, ports in the Pakistan and Sri Lanka, I think the Sri Lankan one opened relatively recently. Uh, the military base in Djibouti, not so far from the US military base there. So all the sorts of investments that uh, China began making years ago in the region, I think are now starting to bear fruit. And if you stand back and look at it, um, you know, the economic footprint, both um, uh, west, east, I'm sorry, um, um, out to the oceans and also uh, east into the hinterland and uh, south down to Thailand, Cambodia, Laos and the like uh, are bearing f fruit and it's formidable. China, you know, the U.S. will never have the same intensity of economic relations with these countries that China has. And if China uh, has the ability to leverage them gradually and forcefully, then I think they'll be, you know, halfway to their aim of uh, dominating the Asia-Pacific. Um, Yes, and so one, one other thing I left off, solidifying relations with Myanmar. China and Myanmar went through a rough period about three years ago. I think Aung San Suu Kyi actually went to Beijing and met Xi Jinping this year. So you can see <clears throat> in, some year, in some areas China has solidified relations, in others um, they're having a, a very tough time, which I think is largely, not entirely, but largely uh, uh, Beijing's fault. Um, um, I guess being able to do a positive and negative side of the ledger, that gives you the sense, and I would certainly agree with this, <coughs> that the region still is very much in play. 
uh, and that is even before we get uh, President Trump. So on that note, thank you. A happy note. <laughs> thank you. Um, Joanna? Great, thank you. Uh, so I've been asked to focus on the sort of the energy, environment, climate nexus of uh, what's been happening with China, the United States, but also I think sort of how the bilateral relationship has been influencing the global regime on, on a lot of these issues. Um, so, you know, if we're sort of looking back at 2016, uh, this year was sort of the last year in an eight-year push by the Obama administration to really uh, beef up cooperation with China on, uh, particularly on energy and climate change issues. And it's been a pretty successful year, I would say, sort of the capstone year of this um, eight-year initiative. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons why the cooperation between our two countries is actually quite constructive in this area, uh, as opposed to in a lot of other areas. And I think this has really been, um, you know, a powerful unifying issue in the U.S.-China bilateral relationship. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons why we have had common interests here, uh, everything from, you know, us being the two largest emitters, the two largest energy consuming countries, but also um, a lot of our domestic challenges in addressing uh, global problems like climate change are actually similar. Uh, both China and the U.S. are struggling with issues about uh, the coal industry and sort of how, how um, jobs and economic uh, downturn in the sector is affecting uh, people's uh, employment and what this means to make a broader transition to low-carbon energy technologies. Um, I think the current high-level engagement that we've had between our leaders through things like the strategic and economic dialogue um, has allowed these countries to politically, you know, discuss politically sensitive issues, but also these more constructive issues um, on how we can cooperate in the technology, energy technology and climate space. And this has really, um, I think, assured, you know, the two largest national economies that they have a diplomatic means of diff diffusing political tensions. And so we can sort of always come back, at least over the last eight years, to this sort of climate and energy space. We can talk about sort of how that might evolve uh, in a bit. So, uh, you know, what I want to really focus on looking back over this year, I think that there were really two areas where the bilateral relationship um, between China and the United States has really had a big influence on the global uh, environmental regime. And then I want to talk a bit about some big successes in, on the technology side, I think, um, that we've been able to achieve. So starting with um, the global picture, I mean, 2016, I think more than any other year, we actually saw bilateral collaboration between China and the U.S. play a crucial role in expanding global action on, a key, on several key environmental issues. Um, first of all, you all know about Paris, and it was about a year and three days ago that we were all sitting in cafes in Paris and trying to uh, make sure we got the first uh, purely global climate deal. Not, not all of us got to do that. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> Someone Memory, negotiating yeah. it. <laughs> Uh, the negotiators were there, too. <laughs> you got to take a break. Uh, I just mean, I think, you know, Paris was really a, a, con a constructive end to um, several years, really eight years of uh, taking a step back from Copenhagen. If you think back to Copenhagen in 2009 and the U.S.-China dynamic in particular at those negotiations, um, you know, you, you started off with, you know, this was the Obama administration just coming in. Uh, really trying to work with China, but I think you just didn't have the same context, you didn't have the same trust, uh, you didn't have this sort of same framework to build upon bilaterally, and I think that was reflected in the, the ways that, you know, the outcome wasn't what either country wanted. Um, and so I think that, you know, the U.S. was strategic in really focusing on uh, making climate change a really centerpiece of the bilateral relationship, making sure every time um, that President Xi, President Obama met, uh, over the last few years that this was one of the top issues on the agenda that had not been the case in the past. Um, and, you know, particularly when Secretary Kerry uh, became Secretary of State, there was a new platform um, that was developed, the Climate Change Working Group in 2013, which was the first time we actually had this high-level um, dialogue that was just on climate, just, you know, allowed our leaders to kind of get each other on the phone when anything came up that was going to potentially derail preparations towards the, uh, the Paris negotiations. And this is, of course, what led to the, the November 2014 joint announcement on climate change, uh, where both countries were putting forward their, their own pledges for Paris a year in advance. And that really, you know, was able to 
um, motivate the rest of the world to do the same and I think was just really instrumental in getting the actual success uh, towards a final agreement in Paris. Um, so that's one that's relatively well known. Maybe less well known is what's been achieved uh, in the Montreal Protocol. Uh, so you know, the Montreal Protocol is really hailed by most around the world as the most successful international environmental agreement, actually one of the most successful instruments of international law that we have, um, partly because of its broad participation and its really strong enforcement mechanisms. And so, uh, you know, we've been able to pretty much phase out the ozone depleting substances over the last couple decades. Uh, and this has been a real success in, in, uh, in sort of how we globally can address environmental challenges. Uh, that said, sometimes when we address one problem, we create another one. And in uh, phasing out ozone depleting substances, CFCs, and the likewise, we actually replace them with um, HFCs and other sort of very potent greenhouse gases. Uh, very, these are industrial gases. China makes a lot of them. Uh, and so this became a heated issue be to address in the climate realm, but because this is actually covered within the Montreal Protocol, um, countries decided that this was the place to address this, and also because you have this very rigorous enforcement mechanism within the context of that treaty. Um, and it was, again, it was the United States and China getting together, really starting, um, starting before this, but I think it was really the Sunnylands um, summit in, in 2013 where this issue was brought up and where both countries sort of at that point started to talk through, okay, how could we come up with a global deal that we could both be okay with, uh, take that back to the rest of the international community and then um, be able to push a global deal. And so that actually did happen this year in October uh, in Kigali, Rwanda. Uh, we have this new amendment um, that now uh, will phase out uh, HFCs as well under Montreal. Um, and then the other big area where I think the U.S. and China, again, played an instrumental role is in controlling aviation emissions. So, you know, aviation and emissions by their nature are these sort of transboundary, you know, cross-border uh, emissions that are uh, difficult to deal with on national, you know, scale alone. And so they're under the jurisdiction of the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO. Uh, and so once again, um, this was, you know, a tough issue, I think, for both the U.S. and China, but they were able to uh, come together and make some bilateral agreement. The um, joint announcement uh, in, uh, I think it was March of this year, um, you actually had both presidents saying, okay, we've, we've come up with some common ground here and we're going to work together to make sure that ICAO uh, is able to come to a global agreement. And they did that uh, this past October. Um, and you've now got about uh, 66 states and about 86.5% of international aviation activity yeah. covered in this. It's voluntary to start, but will um, become mandatory at the moment in uh, 2027. So, you know, three big wins, I think, that were really made possible by the fact that the U.S. and China were able to have these constructive bilateral discussions, uh, get on the same page, and use that to leverage global action. Um, the other thing I want to talk a bit about is just bilaterally what we're doing with China on technology cooperation, particularly in the clean energy space, uh, because this is really the other big area that the U.S. has scaled up uh, its activity over the last eight years. Um, and I think much has really been learned in this area, not just about sort of, you know, where U.S. firms, U.S. universities, national laboratories can benefit through collaboration with China. There's a lot of reasons why China is the largest market in the world for most of these technologies, and so there's actually some benefit to uh, our folks being over there. Um, but also, I think that the U.S.-China case has actually provided interesting lessons for how we do international collaboration on research and development uh, in the clean energy space in particular. Um, you may have heard of something called Mission Innovation, which was launched in Paris last year and um, is been scaling up. This is an initiative for about 20 countries who so are going to double their R&D commitment. This is their government R&D commitment in the clean energy space. And again, China and the U.S. sort of paved the way for that. And then you've got Bill Gates and others now, you know, jumping in with the private sector piece of this. So I think this is interesting to think about as we are looking for ways to uh, scale up these technologies, to bring costs down, to really increase efficiency, productivity, uh, you know, it's worth thinking about how we can do this across borders, which countries have expertise, uh, and how to really use that uh, to, to our advantage and everyone's advantage. Um, and, you know, I think on the technology side, again, this is really, it's a domestic issue. When we look at climate change, you know, there's uh, you know, countries are essentially signing up to the Paris Agreement because it's in their domestic interest to do so. And a lot of that for China is about uh, broader structural reform and what's going to need to happen moving towards more um, 
service-based and high-tech industries. And clean energy technologies have been singled out by the Chinese government as these strategic industries uh, for industrial support and for, you know, really important to the future of the, the country's economy. Uh, it's about jobs, you know, and we see, for example, in California, we saw employment in advanced energy technologies grow six times faster than overall employment just in 2016. Um, so we are cooperating with China across the board in pretty much every energy technology you can think of, from advanced coal technologies to civil nuclear technologies to energy efficiency and renewable energy. Um, but one initiative that I think has been particularly sex successful and had some interesting um, changes in 2016 is the U.S.-China Clean Energy Research Center, uh, the CERC as it's called. I singled this one out because this is actually our largest um, platform for cooperating with China on energy technology. Uh, this is now a five consortium effort. Uh, it covers for the up until 2015, we were working in three consortia on advanced coal technologies, uh, efficient building technologies, and then advanced vehicle technologies, including batteries, electric vehicles. Um, and those, the first five years of this were pretty successful, um, so much so that both uh, the U.S. and Chinese governments decided to renew this for another five years. Um, so that started, that kicked off this year. Uh, and they also expanded it to include two new consortia, two new technology areas, one looking at the nexus between energy and water. This is a big issue in China um, because of the water scarcity and a lot of the technologies they're looking at require a lot of water. Uh, everything from shale gas to um, to clean coal uh, to to even uh, 